Good morning, everyone, and to our friends who are in Minnetonka, Woodside, and those who are worshiping online, glad we can be together today. Um, we're continuing a series called Beautiful Orthodoxy. You can take out your teaching notes. You'll find it there in a moment. We'll get to it. Um, orthodoxy, talking about our core beliefs and how they affect how we live. And beautiful, talking about the, the truth, the beauty, the goodness of the gospel that we get to bring into our everyday worlds. What a gift that is. Next week, we'll wrap up the series we're talking about heaven. It will be a glorious finish. And uh, this last number of weeks, we've been talking about what does the Bible say and what do we believe about the Bible and about God and creation and about sin and salvation, about Jesus Christ. Today, we're talking about Christ's return. And our view of Christ's return actually is declared for us through the centuries through the Apostles' Creed. So stand, let's recite it together. Laying down our foundation, knowing what we believe affects how we live. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, but the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes we say these things without realizing we're actually laying down the foundation of what we believe, knowing, I pray, that it affects how we live. Signs are designed to capture our attention, and they usually do. Sometimes they alert us to danger, sometimes they promote a product, sometimes they help us know where to go and what to do. And some signs defy our understanding altogether, like these signs. This one, make a left. The driver has no idea what to do in this moment. Or this sign, sidewalk closed, use the other side. Sidewalk closed, use the other side. Oh, this walker is totally perplexed. Or this one, sign not in use, not of any <laughs> help to us at all. There you go. Somebody spent a lot of money on that. Hard to read that one, but it says, County Road ends at water. Thanks for the heads up. <laughs> as you're ready to go into the drink. I was in Nashville a couple of years ago, and there was this evangelist on the corner and had all kinds of signs around him concerning the second coming of Christ and was preaching the gospel with hellfire and brimstone. I was not raised with hellfire and brimstone, and many of you have sent me cards along the way, say, Joel, just maybe a little bit more might be of help. I'm not a hellfire brimstone kind of guy, and yet I know the preaching of God's word does not return void. People respond in different ways, but I took it in, was fascinated, and quite honestly, after listening for a long time, I was scared myself. <laughs> Don't think I was supposed to be scared, but I got scared the way he was talking. What can we really know about the second coming of Christ? Um, what I share today is not intended to scare you. I pray that it will capture your attention and help you and direct you. But let's go through a number of things we know. First of all, it will happen. Jesus said so himself. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus likens his coming to lightning, it's powerful, it's mysterious, it will capture our attention, and it has universal consequences. In fact, when you read in the original language, the New Testament that we um, devote ourselves to every week, the word that is most used concerning the second coming of Christ is parousia. It's a word that means coming, or arrival, or presence. And it was used in the first century when there was um, an impending visit of the emperor to your town or your village or to a distinguished guest. It was held for that. It conveys this idea of certainty. The emperor is coming, so let's be prepared for that coming. And so it's used for the second coming of Christ. The king, Jesus, is coming. Let's be prepared. You can count on it. Like yesterday, we, we celebrated at our home um, my mother-in-law's, Carrie's mother's 90th birthday. And everybody in the family came. Our house was full. We knew it was going to happen. We knew it was going to happen in our house. We knew we needed to prepare for all those people coming to our house. 
And so we diligently prepared the house for the gathering of friends, but especially the distinguished guest, my mother-in-law. And one of the family members, by the way, brought um, bunt cakes from nothing bunt cakes, the store in Eden Prairie. I had three of them. They, they were so incredible. <laughs> have you ever been to Eden? You, you need to go there today. I don't know these people. I have no share in what I'm saying here, but I mean, this is not your everyday bunt cake. My big fat Greek wedding bunt cake. Um, I had three of them, all different flavors, and okay, I'm done. I just really enjoyed it. I just think the point is you bring the best when the guest is coming. You prepare for the best, for the distinguished guest, parousia. It's going to happen. Prepare. Prepare for the best. There's another word that gets used and translated called um, apocalypses, or we know it as the apocalypse because um, Hollywood hijacked it and it scared the willies out of the movies that they make related to it. But the word simply translated is revelation. That's what it is. It's, it's going to be a time when Jesus comes when the hidden things are made known. And so the fullness of who Jesus is gets revealed to everyone who walks the face of the earth. And the reality of the condition of the world in which we live gets revealed to everybody who walks the face of the earth. It's interesting in my study this week that there are more than 250 clear references to the return of Christ in the New Testament alone. 250. It's one of the integrative motifs of the scripture. Why do I say that? Because it's not confined to a few obscure passages and we tend to think it's an outlier. Kind of weird. Not sure how to deal with it. But it's common. And in fact, it's not dependent on highly imaginative interpretations of symbolic visions. It's right on the surface of the pages of Scripture because God wants us to see it. He's capturing our attention. He knows that if we see it and believe it, it will affect how we live. When Jesus comes again, it will be utterly climactic. In other words, it will transcend all events of time and space combined that we have ever known or experienced on this earth. And we cannot know everything, but we get glimpses of the things that we need to know. He puts enough in there. He gives us a peak. So I'm just going to share the peak perspective that he gives to us. A number of things. First of all, it will be visible. We read concerning the disciples when Jesus um, rose up. He says, men of Galilee, they said, the angels say, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So we find that Christ's return will be like his departure in his first coming, which was visible and bodily for the disciples who watched Jesus taken up into heaven. And so he will return on the cloud of heaven. Cloud of heaven is a phrase that, that signifies the presence of God. So you find throughout the scriptures clouds um, often referring to the presence of the Lord in the journey of people. And he's going to come in his journey from the heavenly cloud is the picture we get. It will be visible and it will be glorious. It says, then will appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the son of man coming on the cloud of heaven with power and with great glory in other words every eye will see and we know the scripture well that says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord it will be in a moment they will know it and see it acknowledge it and respect it the first advent of Jesus took place in obscurity and in weakness hardly causing a ripple on the surface of the earth. and the condition of humanity, people did hardly take notice because they didn't know most of them. By contrast, his second coming will be a universal public event, triumphant and glorious, we're told. And we will be in awe. I just took a, a moment when I was studying and preparing, thinking, what, what is the most glorious thing I've ever witnessed in my life? And several things popped into my head. The birth of my children was clearly there. A number of things. Uh, and, it, and it's utterly inadequate. You try to get it just visually, what have I just been moved by, in awe by the glory of what I've just seen? And no doubt one of those experiences was when Carrie and I were just dating, we were in the parking lot of her apartment. And it was the first time I had ever witnessed the northern lights. Never seen them before. And your first encounter when the north, with the northern lights is, especially when they're just enveloping you in the place that you are, is something to behold. And we stopped, I stopped, and I took it in. And I know this will pale in comparison to what's ahead, but we will stop, and we will take it in, and we will bow, and we will worship the living God. It will be 
visible, it will be glorious, but also it will be decisive. Paul tells us, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. History as we have known it will come to a close. The curtain will fall on the stages of time as we have experienced them. And the life of every little boy and girl and every grown man and woman is moving toward the advent of Christ. He's coming again. In other words, we're all marching to meet the Lord in his second coming. Whether we know it or not, we're in the same march. We're in the same parade. He's going to come and we're all moving in that given direction. It will be decisive, but also it will be sudden. Matthew says it this way, Jesus speaking, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it, which is really interesting because despite all the references to the signs of the time, the Bible speaks clearly that it will be unexpected. And we start to put it all together. I read an article this week, the top 10 signs that you will know that Jesus is about to return. It was a great article overall. Last uh, week and a half, I was in Florida at a conference and learned that every um, people group in the world for the first time in history will have access to a Bible in their language within five years. That's in our lifetime um, if we prevail um, past tomorrow. But it could happen in our time and place. So this is the time to prepare because it's so sudden, there will be no time to prepare. That even though we get the signs, the reality is we'll be taken back, we'll be startled when that moment actually comes. I have a phrase, um, in fact, if you talk with our staff who have worked with me for a long time, um, they, they start making fun of me because of all these little axioms I have, these little compass statements that I use all the time, and I do it with my children too. They, get, they even get more, and they really get annoyed with me. I'm a dad after all, but one of them, and you've heard me speak about it, is procrastination is the assassination of motivation. You think about that, and it is. So I've used it with my kids, I think 10,002 times, I'm sure. I said it to them when they're needing to clean their rooms and they're procrastinating, when they need to do their homework and they're procrastinating. And now even as young adults, as they're anticipating new career moves, to take that step and find the new job, whatever that might be, if that's what you're feeling as a direction. Procrastination is the assassination for motivation. It takes away your motivation to be prepared as fully as you can. And quite honestly, there is no more important arena of life to prepare for than your spiritual one. Do not procrastinate on that one. Because his coming will be sudden and you will not have time to prepare when he comes. And plus, the goodness of God that comes to us in the here and now is better than any goodness that will come into your life in any other fashion. Amen, Thank you. Experience the goodness of God. I don't get that very often, but I got chills <laughs> in that moment. All right? It's gonna be visible, it's gonna be glorious, it's gonna be decisive, it's gonna be sudden, it's gonna be, this is my favorite personal. First Thessalonians, take this in. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It's a hopeful coming for us. It is a way of living that brings lift and hope and honor and encouragement in our dialogue and our way of being because we know the Lord is going to come again. And the foolishness of the language of our day gets diminished to nothing in the presence of the king who will come to capture us. I love it. Life is just so hard in the here, but God is so good in the here now and in the there still to come. The goodness of God is the best goodness of all. But this verse really speaks to my heart the most. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He was speaking to the disciples who were so sad and so afraid that Jesus was leaving them. He goes, no, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm coming back for you. I'm gonna take you to be with me where I am. Love that picture that he is with us now where we are through the presence of the Holy Spirit, but we will be with him there in the fullness of the face of Jesus the Christ. He, he's setting up this anticipation of that day still to come. So these expressions that I've just given you are 
part of the, the nature of what the second coming, the glimpse that we get to see at least. But then let's shift gears. What can we know about the purpose of the second coming of Christ? Well, I think there's twofold primary ideas that come forth. First, he comes to complete the work of redemption. Paul says it this way, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. He'll come for those who belong to him. That's the promise, and he'll come to all. And then all God's enemies, sin, death, and the devil will be removed from God's earth. He'll make right all the wrongs that we see around us. And we will have gladness for the justice that will be done in full Christ will fully implement the conquest and the victory won decisively in his first advent, which we celebrate for the first advent of Christmas season in two Sundays. But it wasn't just about his coming, for God so loved the world, that's the incarnation, that he came into the messiness of our backyard, that we who believe would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the promise. But it comes to completion in the second coming, so first advent anticipates the second Yes, it's Christmas, but we, we anticipate the coming again of our Lord in the Christmas season, and I look forward to that. But the second thing which gets elevated again and again in the scriptures from beginning to again is that he comes to judge. We don't like this, it makes us a little unsettled, but for we all stand before God's judgment seat. In other words, all of us must appear before him, and it will be for everyone, we're told in Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead. There's our declarative statement in the Apostles' Creed that we read, uh, recited together earlier. Somehow by the power of God operating through the person of Jesus Christ, all of us who have ever lived are going to be called back in some kind of form, bodily form, some kind of embodied life. We don't have clarity from the scriptures exactly what that looks like, but we know somehow the soul and the body will be reunited when we come together. It's not going to be zombie-like, so don't let Hollywood... You know, the living dead picture, that's just eerie. It's not, no, it's much better. It's much better. He'll bring us into a glorified state. And that is a beautiful thing that we get to anticipate in the presence of the Lord. So it's gonna be glorious. But his resurrection is always in the view of the judgment to come. And in that judgment, we know it will be permanent and irrevocable. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of the wise um, virgins and the foolish virgins. I'm not going to read all of it because of its length, but let me give you a summary of what it says. The, the wise and the foolish virgins are, virgins are about to make their way um, to go meet the bridegroom. And the foolish virgins have uh, lamps, but they don't bring with them any oil because they anticipate that any moment Jesus is going to come again. But the wise ones bring the lamp with the oil. And Jesus, according to the parable, it says the bridegroom was late. In other words, every generation expects that the coming of the Lord is going to be in their generation. And you read that even throughout history. But not always prepared that he's going to be late. He's not going to come when we think he's going to come. And therefore, when he does come, the foolish virgins do not have the oil in the lamp. And the wise ones are prepared and available for the coming of the bridegroom because they've got the oil in the lamp. And Jesus concludes the parable saying, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. A right response for us is to be prepared and to be available, knowing that Jesus is coming anytime and how you live today matters then. You're either ready or you're not, are you? You can answer that question in the quietness of your soul. And then we learn it will be according to what we have done. Revelation 22 says it this way. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Jesus tells us that there will be a definite and clear separation of the human race into two different groups. Those who believe and received Jesus Christ, who reveals the very purposes of God the Father to us, and those who do not, who reject God, who do not embrace the revelation of his son. And in Matthew 25, Jesus likens this event to the shepherds who separate the sheep and the goats from one another those who know him and those who don't, those who believe and will receive a reward and those who don't and will receive eternal death, eternal life versus eternal death. When you think of a judge, um, 
you, you think of a courtroom and a trial. And the final judgment will be a trial unlike any that we have ever seen before. In the courtroom of our day and our experiences, the trials are interesting to say the least, but there's a struggle to, ex to establish exact truth. There's this mystery, so you watch Dateline and all these different hearings, and you're always wondering what's the end of the story and who did what. We don't know. Witnesses are called and they're interrogated, and lawyers make their profound arguments along the way. And the process is lengthy and it's filled with uncertainty. And in fact, even after the trial and after the verdict, doubts may linger by the public as to whether or not the jury reached the right conclusion. And personally, this is, I don't know how you are when you take in some of these cases and the trials that are so public today. That's probably the most ever present one for me right now is the Russians. I think they haven't enough for other Russians. Anybody had enough for other Russians? That the Russians, um, you know, which party doesn't matter. They all have their view about the, the Russians and, and how they intercepted the 2016 election. My feeling is that we will hear this every day of every month of every year to the next election and wonder what's the truth depending on which party you take. Let me just say with clarity, this will not be the case on the final judgment. <laughs> uh, every fact is available. Every secret is made known. And in his infinite knowledge and wisdom, the judge will rule infallibly, graciously, and fairly. The judgment is coming. And for some, this is a frightening thought and it stirs up anxiety in one's life, but only for those who do not believe and wonder what the verdict will be for them because many think it will never happen. And some ponder it and go, well, what would it be for me on that day? But for believers, the scripture is very clear that we are not to be in fear. In fact, believers look forward to the judgment as a time when the truth will be made known and justice will be done and that we personally will be humbled in that day, glad for grace and mercy that met us in Jesus Christ who covers our sin. I confess, I am a sinner in need of a savior. I deserve condemnation for my sin. There's no goodness that I have in and of myself that would qualify in the righteousness of God to leave me not guilty. It's only through his presence and provision. And we find this picture in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that Jesus takes my sin. He's the umbrella of mercy. So I'm counted righteous through the righteousness of Christ who took upon himself my guilt and my death that I could have right relationship with the living God. This is grace and mercy. On that day when he comes, we will be overcome with gladness and humility. Thank you, God, for coming for me. Or we read in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I do not live my life with a feeling that I will be condemned even in my shortcomings, I live with the confidence of Christ who covers my sin and sets me free every day, and I invite you to do the same. So now what? Well, there are signs. There are clear signs that point to the coming of Jesus. And we see, as Jesus said, it will be like lightning. It will be mysterious, and it will be powerful. And we will stop, probably fall to our knees in the presence of the Lord. And we will take in the beauty of the one who is to come. And how does it affect how we live? Well, that's beautiful orthodoxy. And really, it's the expression through the challenge and the invitation that I gave to us in January. It's really quite simple. When I invited us to take a next step and grow your faith. Wherever you might be, keep growing in faith. Keep growing in love with Jesus Christ. Your confidence will rise. He will quicken your heart and your mind to the reality of his presence and what he wants to do with you and through you in your journey. So if you're flatlined in your spiritual growth right now, you know it. If you feel like, like I'm just dead in the water in my faith, come alive. And we got through volume one all kinds of opportunities to help invite you in that journey. We will come alongside of you. Take a next step and grow your faith. Then walk across the room and share your faith because this mercy and this grace and this goodness that has been given to us is not to be selfishly enjoyed. It's to be shared beautifully with your friends and family and neighbors who may not know the presence of the living Christ. And there's simple ways you can begin that relationship. Invite them to the Christmas concert. I invited 10 people to the Christmas concert this year. <laughs> and uh, be like me that way. I mean, who, who do I think could come and really be blessed in that experience? Invite people to come and join you. And some who are unchurched 
We'll have the gospel seed planted even on that given day. Take a next step, grow your faith, walk across the room, share your faith, open your hands, and pour out unprecedented amounts of mercy to those in need. We get to do that every day in simple ways, words of encouragement. You can tell when people have need, pay attention, come alongside of them. We do it in great complex ways. Our Christmas Eve offering is specifically dedicated to the poor, the disadvantaged, the needy, somewhere in the world, and and man, have we had a fall like this? Can you remember a fall like this when we've had so many natural disasters? It's impacted almost every weekend our worship service planning experience because there's there's a hurricane or there's an earthquake or there's mass murder every single week this fall. Do we say something about it? Do we pray? Well, yes, we always want to be in prayer. We always want to open our hands with unprecedented amounts of mercy. We're gonna do that. The Christmas Eve offering is gonna go to the victims of some of these horrific crimes and natural disasters that we've experienced. Think about that for your own generosity. But the, the truth of the coming of the Lord is for us is this. Now is the time to prepare. In other words, don't wait until it's too late. We won't have time to prepare when he comes. This is the day, and I, I read an article this week that there's this guy forecasting that this is the weekend that he's coming, so I, it was a really fascinating, you can Google it and learn by the end of this day, he's coming, and if that's the case, I have prepared you well, okay? <laughs> Just saying. Um, I had a young adult say to me, I'm gonna wrap up with this thought, a young adult gal said to me, and her life's just in a tough, tough place. She says, my life is in such a shambles right now. And I just quietly listened to the burden of her life and her soul. And the first words out of my life is, yeah, you're right. Your life is a shambles. But God is in it with you. And then I shared with her next words. Simply, didn't give a lot of narrative, just said, I would recommend that you devote yourself fully to Jesus Christ and be baptized. And I promise you, help will come back and hope will be yours because the risen Christ has come once already to give us that help and hope and he comes again to fulfill it. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. So as some understand slowness, people go, well, it's been 2,000 years. What's the deal, right? Where is he at? Then he says, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, to life. In your doubt and your confusion, come to Christ. In your weakness and your fear, come to Christ. In your heartache and your tears, come to Christ. In your disappointment, and your disillusionment come to Christ because Christ has already come to you and he'll receive you and bless you. And you don't have to say anything right now if you'd like to pray a prayer of coming to Christ. You don't have to say anything out loud. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to come to the front. You just, in your heart, offer yourselves fully to the Lord and receive his goodness, which is for day, for today and for all eternity. Amen. Let's stand and pray together. Father, in this moment, I'd like to consider myself as one that wants to come. Um, I have salvation, but I come to be reminded of your coming again and the goodness of mercy and grace that has met me all of my days. And I'm mindful for some in the room who have been wayward and distant maybe for some time, and I pray that they would come and renew their faith and take that next step. I'm mindful of those who know you not, who have come with a spouse or a friend or just by themselves and might be seeking or wondering, God, who are you? Jesus, are you the son of God? Are you savior? And you are. And I pray by the prompting of your Holy Spirit, you would reveal that as no person or no words can in and of themselves, just through the presence of your spirit who mediates the very person of the King of Kings, Jesus the Christ, reveal God the Father in the heavenly realm who is with us today and always. And if that be you, just say these words quietly in your heart. I receive this mercy that covers sin, my sin, and forgives my sin. I come to you, Jesus. I receive life today, knowing that it is a promise of life forever. And we praise you. So with your eyes, see us. With your ears, hear our praise. With your mighty right hand, reach down and touch each of us in our given place and raise us up to embrace the reality of Jesus the Christ, Son of God, Savior of our soul.